I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. We're glad you're here today for a great uh, patriotic weekend Sunday, and a lot of great things are planned for this. And uh, uh, just enjoy and uh, be proud to be a Christian and proud to be an American. Shed his grace on 
I want to share with you our prayer list this morning, and uh, there, there are lists out on the table, and you can take those. Many, many folks with cancer, and uh, that, what a terrible disease, and, uh, but there are uh, some, some addendums, some that I might add on. I, I see David Wright is, uh, is on our prayer list. David fell Thursday and broke his hip, had surgery Thursday evening, and he's been in Norton's Brownsboro, and so we need to keep David in our prayers. And then also, uh, I know uh, uh, Shirley Trader's grandson, Zachariah, is traveling overseas. He's with a group of teenagers, and they're in, uh, in, uh, in, a in Europe, and so we need to keep them in our prayers as they're traveling in Greece. And one more I'll add to your list. Katie Allen, many of you know Katie, and Lisa's not here this morning. Her mother, uh, Lisa's caring for Katie right now. Katie had... Uh, some gastric bypass surgery and all went well but now she's to the point where she's to be on solid food and she's having trouble keeping down solid food so her mother's with her today and we need to pray for katie and pray for lisa as she ministers to her to her daughter let's go to god as we begin our time in worship today thank you father for blessing us for bringing us together to worship you we lift up to you these on our prayer list and all our prayer needs Remember us, Father, and bless us. Bless this service this day in honor to our country, but especially, Father, in honor to you. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time. Time for the church to pray for America. An old-time preacher once said, Pray, has it really come to that? Well, friends, it has come to that. We live in a day this nation's founders could not have imagined. A day when principles like faith in a holy God and the conviction that his word should guide our lives are under attack. Not from without, but from within. In the name of liberty, it seems we tolerate everything. Everything except the truth. Let's pray together. Let's pray for our nation. Father in heaven, You've blessed us with a freedom that much of the world does not know. You've given us your church. And, Father, we have traditionally been a Christian nation. But, Father, these are difficult times. And so we lift up to you, Father, our, our land. Father, from coast to coast, north to south, we just ask, Father, that you would bless this nation of ours. Bless each of us that we would be yours, that we would stand up and not be ashamed of the freedoms we have in America, not ashamed of the nation in which we're a part of. Father, bless America. Bless that we might see the church go stronger and stronger, not just in this nation, but throughout the world. But may, may the United States of America be a shining light, a beacon to the world as we stand forth for truth and justice and honesty and spirituality through Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. A couple of scriptures and then some thoughts on this. In Luke's gospel, verses 19 and 20, uh, Luke tells us about the Last Supper. He says, And Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. July the 4th, well, July the 4th weekend. It's a time to remember. And communion is a time to remember as well. It's a time to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. The bread and the juice are tangible physical reminders of Christ's love for us. Every time we eat and drink this together, it's a reminder of the sacrifice of Christ. 
just as we depend on food and drink to survive physically, we can only live spiritually through Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice on the cross. In the dictionary, it describes communion as a close relationship with someone in which feelings and thoughts are exchanged. Communion is a relationship that is close and special. This is a silly question, but do you love God? Do you love God in such a manner that you magnify him? Do you long to be in his presence? Do you thirst to hear from him and value the time that you give to God? Sometimes it seems that we're so busy doing things that we consider to be of value for our lives. But how much more important in value do we put on our relationship with Christ? You can uh, determine it by measuring how much love, how much you love him, and how much of Christ is on your mind and in your daily walk. You can measure it by how often you spend reading his word, praying to him, listening to him. And by your being here this morning to participate in this service, great patriotic weekend, and this Lord's Supper, it's an opportunity to show that you love Jesus. I'm going to pray, and then we'll partake together of the bread and the juice. Thank you, Father, for salvation that comes through the shed blood of Jesus and for his willingness to go to Calvary for us. Forgive us, Father, when we don't take time for you and uh, your word and your son. But, Father, may we be brought closer to you, to him, to the Holy Spirit that indwells us today as we partake of this Lord's Supper together. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake of the bread and the juice. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Fourth of July weekend. Has anybody already been uh, shooting out fireworks? Or just not getting any sleep because your neighbors are? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, uh, it's great to be in the house of the Lord together, uh, worshiping Him as a church family. Uh, would you pray with me before we get started? Uh, God, thank you so much for today and uh, for this weekend where we uh, celebrate uh, this nation that you have blessed us with. And uh, we just thank you so much uh, for the freedoms uh, that our country offers us and uh, to, to be able to worship you uh, freely and to, um, uh, to, to not worry about the persecution that many Christians experience around the world. Uh, God, we just uh, praise your name uh, for the ability that we have uh, to uh, worship you freely. Uh, we praise your name for all the good things that you give us in life. Uh, we praise your name for the greatest gift that you have given us, uh, salvation through your son. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, so growing up in the, in the Bible Belt, going to church every Sunday, it was never a question for me whether or not God existed. It was just an assumed reality, uh, like whether or not the sun was going to come up in the morning, or if, uh, if you threw something in the air, whether it was going to come back down, or whether or not on uh, Fridays at school the lunch would be rectangle pizza. It was, it was just an assumed reality, you know? Uh, but for the very first time, I, remember, I can remember doubting the existence of God, it, was, it wasn't until my sophomore year of high school, actually. Up until that point, I never really thought about it much, uh, never really contemplated whether or not God was there or not. Um, but uh, one time, uh, my sophomore year of high school, I was at a friend's house uh, with a group of guys from my football team. And uh, this topic came up that we'd never discussed before. I don't exactly remember how the topic came up, but the topic of death came up. And uh, it wasn't a typical conversation. Uh, it was an unusual topic, especially for a bunch of high school guys. Uh, but uh, we started uh, talking about it. And uh, one of my friends said that he thought that his opinion was that when a person died, it was, it was just the end. Uh, it was just nothingness, that, uh, that you just ceased to exist. 
Uh, there wasn't an afterlife. There was, there was no heaven or hell. It was just the end. And I was kind of taken aback by this because I hadn't really ever contemplated it before. And uh, I asked him the question, well, don't you believe in God? And his response was just, no. Why would I? I mean, I've never seen him. He's never talked to me. And you, you think I'm just supposed to believe that it's something you can't see, something who doesn't talk to you, exists. But if I simply believe he exists, I'll live with him forever after I die. And then he said, that seems silly to me. And I thought, as a sophomore in high school, well, when you put it that way, it doesn't, doesn't sound too believable. I, I thought very highly of my friend. We were pretty good friends uh, up until that point. We were still friends after that, but up until then, I, I, I thought highly of him. He was very smart. He was a very smart kid in school. He was, he was very nice. Uh, he wasn't uh, the type of kid that got in trouble a lot. He wasn't the type of kid who got into bad things on the weekends. He was a very good kid. He was very smart. And, and so because of what I thought of him, I considered what he had to say. Maybe he's right. Uh, the question whether or not I had been lied to my entire life filled my mind. My, my parents growing up always told me that God exists. They, they took me to church where they told me about God. They, they all told me to read the Bible, which talks about God. But did he even exist at all? That question sent me on a decade-long journey to find the answer. Does God exist? And even, even if he does, can we really know anything about him? Does it matter whether he exists? Is the God that I believe in the actual God? Or is the God the Muslims believe in really God? Or the Mormons? Or is God just a spiritual essence that, that flows through the universe like the Hindus and the Buddhists believe? Has God really spoken to us? Or is the Bible just made up fairy tales? Did God really send his son into this world to die for our sins. All of the questions that I had just taken for granted, I tried to answer them and to find out the truth. And what I found gave me reason to believe what I had just assumed to be true. Uh, this morning, we're starting a, a new sermon series called Reason to Believe. Uh, this, is a, this is a play on words. Uh, hopefully this series will give you a reason to believe. Uh, but I also hope that reason will lead you to believe. Uh, as a freshman in college, I read On Reason. It would say a book by Thomas Paine uh, written at the height of the Enlightenment. Uh, Thomas Paine was a deist. Uh, he, he, he believed that there was a God but that that God had nothing to do with anything going on throughout history. Uh, essentially, he believed that, that God created everything and then wound it up kind of like a clock and just left it to run its course. Uh, Thomas Paine had a, a very low view of Scripture, and he largely believed uh, the Bible to be made up superstitious fairy tales. Uh, he did not believe in the resurrection or, or that Jesus was God. Uh, he believed that truth could not be found in the Bible, but in reason. Uh, he, he believed that reason and faith in biblical Christianity were mutually exclusive. Uh, that you could not believe in the God of the Bible and also hold up science and reason. That they could not both be true. 
Uh, but hopefully, uh, this sermon series will help us to see uh, that the two are very compatible. Reason and faith. Almost 250 years after uh, Thomas Paine wrote his treatise on reason, science has come a long way. And if a scientist is honest, he will tell you that every new scientific discovery actually leads us closer to God, not farther away. Faith in the Bible and in Jesus and in the resurrection is very reasonable. In the next two weeks, we'll, we'll talk about whether, uh, whether or not the resurrection was a real historical event or if it was just a uh, made-up superhero origin story. Uh, we'll talk about whether or not we can trust the Bible. Is it actually God's Word, or is it just a bunch of hooey? Uh, but today, uh, we're going to talk about the existence of God. Uh, I, want, I want to give you three philosophical arguments that offer a reasonable case for the existence of God. Uh, my own personal journey to find the truth about whether or not God exists led me to these three arguments. Uh, when they are coupled together, I believe they offer incontrovertible proof for God's existence. They convinced me, and hopefully they will convince you as well. Uh, the first argument is called the ontological argument, and it was first put forth by a guy named Anselm of Canterbury in the, thir in the 11th century uh, AD. Uh, this is a purely logical argument, and it's based on the law of co non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction states that two opposite things cannot both be true. Uh, for instance, you cannot claim that a circle is a square. They both cannot be true. It's contradictory. You, you can't claim that a cat is a dog. It's contradictory. Right? You cannot claim that the Kentucky Wildcats are good at football, right? It's, it's contradictory. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, anyway, uh, Anselm's argument uh, went like this uh, God is the greatest being that can possibly be conceived, it is impossible to imagine a greater being than God. Because he's the greatest conceivable being. If there was a greater conceivable being, if you could imagine a being greater than God, then that being would be God. And so whatever is the greatest conceivable being is God. And God is the greatest conceivable being. Uh, we can conceive of God in many forms. It's possible to conceive of God existing as a as an imaginary. That, that God does not really exist in reality. We can imagine that to be true, that, that to be the case. We, we can imagine that God is just a myth or a fairy tale. It's also possible to conceive of God as existing in reality. That he is an actual being that exists. Uh, since a being that exists in reality is greater than a being that is only imaginary, then God must necessarily exist in reality because he is the greatest conceivable being. Uh, so the statement that God does not exist actually violates the law of non-contradiction because God is the greatest conceivable being and therefore, he must necessarily exist, since it's greater to imagine that he exists than he doesn't. Hopefully, you're tracking with me. Hopefully, you're making, I'm making sense. The greatest conceivable being cannot not exist, because it's greater for him to exist than to not exist, if that makes sense. Uh, therefore, God does indeed exist. Boom, solved right there. Uh, actually, this, this argument definitively proves that God exists. Because whatever is the greatest being that exists is God. Uh, basically, this argument comes down to the idea that whatever is the greatest entity that exists, that, whatever that is, 
is God because it is the greatest entity that exists. People know this intuitively, uh, but they do not want to acknowledge the existence of the biblical God. Uh, But instead, they, they want to rely solely on what they can perceive materially, what they can see around them. What they know for, for sure, just like my friend in high school, he, he only wanted to rely on what he could see with his eyes, what he could hear with his ears. And so people look at our world and they see that human beings are the greatest beings in the world. They're at the top of the food chain. And, and they come to the conclusion that since Humans are the greatest beings that that we can see that exists. They believe themselves to be God. And they act like it. They set their own rules. They they live the way they want to live. They are a God unto themselves. They live in the same way that the ancient Israelites did during the period of the Judges. Judges 17, it says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was nobody that they perceived to be the greatest who was giving them laws to live by. And so they came up with their own personal law to live by. And they lived by that. And they also did not acknowledge God as a greater being than themselves. And they did not follow his law. They lived however they wanted because they were gods unto themselves. And that is how people in general live today, as if they are the greatest beings that exist. However, if there was a being that is greater than man, that being would be God and man would not be. There are Eastern religions who believe that there is a great cosmic force that flows through the universe. They believe this cosmic force to have some sort of sentience, some sort of intelligence. Uh, Hindus, for instance, believe that this this being to be the driving force behind the idea of karma. If you wrong someone, uh, this, this cosmic force will ensure that you will receive equal harm in some way. This is the idea of karma. And so because this cosmic being is greater to man, for them, this cosmic force is God. Anselm's argument proves that there is indeed a God that exists. But it doesn't prove what that God actually is. Is it the universe? Is it uh, something outside of the universe? It doesn't answer that question. It merely proves that the statement, God doesn't exist, is a contradictory statement. And so that leads us to the second argument. It's called the cosmological argument. Uh, This is the age-old question, uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Every effect has a cause. The egg comes from the chicken, but that chicken came from an egg, and that egg came from another chicken, and so on and so forth, back for all eternity. Except, uh, the philosopher Plato suggested that there had to be a first cause, one that itself had no cause. There had to be a beginning, an uncaused cause. Aristotle, his student, built on this idea, and he called this uncaused cause the prime mover, the origination of movement in the universe. In the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas built further on this idea, and he applied it to the God of the Bible as the original prime mover. Now, the cosmological argument is that there has to be something that has always existed, and whose existence is not contingent on anything else, and whose existence is necessary. That this is the ultimate uh, primary cause of all things that currently exist. This is the prime mover, something that has always existed, something that necessarily exists. 
Now, there are really only two options for what this uncaused cause could possibly be. Either it's the universe itself, meaning that the universe has always existed and it is uncaused itself, or something that exists outside of the universe is the uncaused cause that has made the universe exist. For centuries, there was really no definitive scientific proof one way or another, whether it was the universe or if it was something outside the universe. Uh, when Thomas Paine, for instance, wrote his uh, Treatise on Reason, there was, there was no way that he could say one way or the other, whether it was the universe that had always existed or whether there was something outside of the universe that caused it to exist. Whether the universe itself is God or if there is another being outside the universe that is God. That is until 1824. A French mechanical engineer named uh, Sadi Carnot, he expressed the first successful theory of the maximum efficiency of the heat engine. Exciting stuff. But what, what he did in his theory is he laid the foundations for a whole new scientific discipline called thermodynamics. His work was built upon by later scientists Rudolf Clausius and Lord Kelvin. Uh, if you, you might be familiar with these people from physics class when you were in high school or something like that. Um, uh, but these guys, they formally defined the second law of thermodynamics and the con concept of entropy. Uh, the second law of ther thermodynamics definitively proved that the universe had a beginning. That the universe could not have been the prime mover. And that something outside of the universe had to be the original cause of the universe's existence. Now, the second law of thermodynamics is, is actually rather simple, uh, even though it sounds really, really complicated. Uh, I don't claim to be a, a science whiz or anything like that. Uh, so if I can understand it, you can too. Uh, but the law states that in a closed system, processes tend toward equilibrium. Now that sounds complicated, but we see this play out all the time in our everyday life. If you take a glass of ice water, for instance, and you set it on your kitchen table, the, the water in that glass will be about 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you let it sit there long enough, uh, the temperature of the room, will, of the, the air in the room will actually act on that water. Uh, energy will be transferred from the air around the glass to the water. And the, the air around the glass is uh, room temperature, 70 degrees or so. And, and so eventually what will happen is the temperature of the water will reach equilibrium with the air around it. It will equal the temperature around it. This is the second law of thermodynamics that processes tend toward equilibrium. Uh, in the fall, our family loves to make campfires in the backyard in our fire pit and, and roast hot dogs and, and marshmallows. Fire burns hot. We have to tell our kids this. Don't go near the fire because it will burn you because it's really hot. Fire burns at something like 50 degrees or 50 degrees, 500 degrees. Uh, very hot. But in the fall, right, the air is cool, maybe about 45 degrees or something like that. If you let the fire burn, eventually... It will burn out and it will be cooled by the air around it and the temperature of the campfire will reach equilibrium to the air around it. This is the second law of thermodynamics. But let's apply that same principle to the universe, to space. Out in space, there are billions of really, really big campfires. They're burning at about 27 million degrees or so, give or take. We call them stars, right? And in between these stars is space that is very cold. Something like uh, negative 455 degrees. Uh, those two temperatures, uh, 27 million and negative 455, are not equal, right? I'm not a math whiz, but those are not the same, right? They're not equal. Uh, how long would it, set, would it take... Uh, you think, to, for a campfire to burn out? 
overnight, 24 hours, depending on how, how big it is, maybe, maybe a little longer, maybe a couple days. Well, how long would it take for a star to burn out? That could take millions of years, right? How long would it take for all of the stars in the universe to burn out? A long time. Who knows? I don't know. But if it took a trillion years, for instance, just to throw that number out there, a trillion, even though it's a really, really long time, is less than eternity. If it was 10 trillion years, that's how long it took for all the stars to burn out. That would be less than eternity. And so... The second law of thermodynamics tells us that since all the stars in the universe have not burned out yet, the universe had to have a beginning. In the last 150 years or so, uh, largely due to Hubble's law that the universe is expanding, the theory of the Big, Big Bang has been used to explain the origin of the universe. I think scientists say it's the universe is 13 billion years old, something like that. And their theory is that there was a big bang that was the primary mover. It was the original cause. Science has shown that the universe has a beginning. The ontological argument proves that that whatever has always existed is God. The cosmological argument proves that, that the something that has always existed exists outside of the universe. And it has caused the universe to come into existence. Science has no way really of defining what that something is other than to call it a Big Bang. However, the third and final argument gives us a much clearer picture about what that something that has always existed might be. The third argument is called the teleological argument also called the argument from design. And the argument, or this argument uh, was put for, forth first by Socrates uh, way back thousands of years ago, uh, but Thomas Aquinas built on it later. Uh, later there were Christian philosophers, William Turner and John Ray, uh, but probably the most significant uh, Christian philosopher was William Paley uh, when it comes to this argument. He wrote a book in 1802 called the Natural Theology, or evidences of the existence and attributes of the deity. In this work, Paley originated what's called the watchmaker analogy, which argues that a design implies a designer. Uh, The argument goes like this. We can observe that beings in nature have certain qualities that appear to exist for a specific purpose. For example, insects have wings. Probably got some flies coming in your house. They're flying around because they have wings. Wings have a specific purpose for the insect to fly. Human beings have hands. These hands have specific purposes. They have a specific purpose. Eyes, ears, fur, brains, all of these characteristics that beings have, they all have a specific purpose purpose. And if something has a purpose, necessarily it had to be designed. Something that occurs randomly does not have a purpose. If I were to take uh, a handful of nails and just throw them around the room, it would be silly for someone to come in the room and ask the question, why is this nail sticking into this particular wall? Why is it in this particular wall? Well, it just landed there randomly because I just tossed it out randomly for no reason whatsoever. Uh, Likewise, if you walked into a room and you noticed a, a nail that was sticking into a wall and there was a picture hanging from that nail, you wouldn't think, wow, Someone must have randomly thrown nails around this room, and this one just happened to land here where this picture is hanging. That would be silly, wouldn't it? This was William Paley's watchmaker analogy. If you were walking through the forest and you just happened upon a watch, if you were to bend down and pick up that watch, you would not assume that the watch appeared there randomly. 
You would not assume that something as complex as a watch were to just randomly come into being and be able to perfectly tell time. No, you would assume that since it has the purpose of telling time, that there was a designer who designed it with that purpose in mind. If there are things in nature that have specific purposes, there must be a designer who designed them with those purposes in mind. Whatever is designed must have a designer. Some things in nature are designed because they have a specific purpose. Therefore, there must be a designer. And by necessity, that designer must be intelligent. It cannot be mystical or ethereal, uh, some being that is just some cosmic force that just randomly, haphazardly does things. It must be intelligent. Uh, Moreover, there are many aspects of nature that are best explained by the existence of an intelligent designer. Uh, The complexity of the human eye, for instance. The unique properties of water as an enabler for life. The amazing survival equipment of many living things. Uh, Beetles, for instance, have an exoskeleton. Exoskeletons appear to exist for the specific purpose of protection of the beetle. If it has a purpose, it was designed with that purpose in mind. There are things that exist that are irreducibly complex. That means that they are so complex that if one part, even just one part, is missing... The entire thing will not function. The human eye has 40 individual subsystems that all work in conjunction to make the eye work properly. If just one of those subsystems were to be missing, the eye would not function. The retina alone has 137 million cells shaped like rods and cones. 130 million rods handle black and white vision, and the other 7 million cones allow us to see in color. If even that one subsystem is missing, the eye would not work. The fact that life exists on earth is best explained by the existence of intelligent design. In 1913, Lawrence Joseph Henderson wrote a book called The Fitness of the Environment. Uh, where he advanced the notion that the earth is perfectly suited for life to exist. It has since been said that it, it would seem as though the universe were finely tuned to make life on earth possible. There are 26 constants in the universe that if they were off by just 1%, life on earth would not exist. For centuries, science, scientists uh, postulated that planets revolved around other stars, just like planets revolve around our sun. But it wasn't until 1992 that the first confirmed exoplanet was discovered. In January of 2015, 23 years later, NASA announced the detection of the thousandth exoplanet that they discovered. It took 23 years to detect a thousand planets outside the solar system. But this, just this past March, March of 2022, NASA announced the discovery of their 5,000th exoplanet. 4,000 in seven years. They keep discovering planets, and none have the habitability that Earth has. There are 200 parameters that a planet needs for life to be possible. The planet must orbit the correct distance from the correct type of star, in the right location, in the right type of galaxy. Uh, There must be a specific arrangement of planets. There must, um, it needs to have a a large planet similar to uh, Jupiter, uh, exerting an offsetting amount of gravity. It must have a stable orbit and a stable rotation. It must be a terrestrial planet with plate tectonics. It must have the right size moon at the right size distance, and it must have the right type of atmosphere. Over 200, or there are 200 parameters that a planet needs. It needs to have all of them for life to exist. The probability that life on Earth would exist is 1 in 10 to the 37th power. 
That's a one with 37 zeros behind it. That's one zero 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 zero. I'm gonna need to get my toes up. It is highly improbable that life would exist, and it is best explained through intelligent design, that there was a designer that designed it that way. There was an atheist evolutionary biologist. He was atheist. His name was Michael Denton. He wrote a book entitled Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, where he said, to common sense, it does appear absurd to propose that chance could have thrown together devices of such complexity and ingenuity that they appear to represent the very epitome of perfection. Thousands of years before all these philosophers came up with these arguments to provide evidence for the existence of God, the psalmist David wrote these words. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. God's creation reveals his existence. Paul wrote it, Romans 1, 19 through 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Meaning people who deny his existence. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. What we see and observe in nature, in God's creation, declares that he exists. Complex systems do not happen randomly, they are designed. And if they are designed, there must be a designer. But how can we know who that designer is? Thomas Paine, he believed in a designer. But he believed that this designer had no interaction with his creation after he created it. Muslims believe that Allah is that designer. Is that designer the God of the Bible? Or is it someone or something else? How can we know for sure? To answer that question, you'll have to come back next week. Would you pray with me? Uh, God, thank you so much uh, for uh, today and this, this message. Uh, the message that you do indeed exist. But in reality, this, this message doesn't really need to be so complicated. We can look at your creation. We can look at the stars in the sky and see that you exist, that you created all this, that you are that designer. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for coming into this world as the man Jesus to help us to know for sure who you are. And I pray that all of us would come back next week to learn more about how we can know who you are because you've spoken to us. You've revealed yourself to us and help us tell as many people as we can that there is a God and that they can know you. They can know how much you love them. They can know that you have given them a hope and a future. They can know that they can have salvation through your son. It's in your name I pray. Amen.
Amen.